So to speak a little bit about the study results. So this table compares students' average scores according to some different groupings on their essays compared to their interviews. So the base score here is the essay, and from that we subtract the interview score, and we color code the cells to do a little bit of quick um, comparison. So the color coding, what it means here, the red cells show areas where interviews convey a lot more information about students' critical information literacy than essays. Um, that is, the interview score is, is considerably higher than the essay score, um, ranging down to orange where the difference is slighter, but interviews still tell more. Yellow cells show areas where interviews and essays are pretty similar, and green cells show areas where essays provide uh, more information, light green to dark green, where it's a lot more information than interviews do. So what this chart helps to establish is the differences on average and in what inter inter essays and interviews capture, as well as some of the similarities. So what we see here, just in a kind of broad snapshot, interviews capture information essays miss, as well as about the type of work, uh, how it affects students' source selection and use especially, that's the column with the most red in it. Um, they also capture some important information that essays miss for many students in the areas of journalistic practices, author expertise, and source research. This is true for all students, but especially true for, true for students of color, students who identify as marginalized, and for students who identify as defending their own culture. Um, essays, on the other hand, capture more information about methods, local sourcing, and diverse voices. And there was less of an overall difference here between students when they were grouped according to race, identification, and defense of culture. So one important thing to note here is that um, these averages of groups can mask a lot of variation within groups. So we're going to go on now to present findings that look at the extent to which those hold up when we subject them to quantitative statistical analysis, um, which would account for that kind of variation among groups. And so the findings that we're going to report here, for the most part, unless noted otherwise, meet the statistical threshold for significance of point zero, of a point of a p-value of 0 0.05, which means that there's a 95% chance or greater that the relationships that we're seeing here are caused by the factors we're looking at, not caused by random chance. So drawn for interview sources, we see that students who self-identify as marginalized have a total source analysis score across all seven indicators, so a maximum score of seven of 4.57 compared to mainstream identifying students who average a total score of 2.56. And so to kind of see this in action from a marginalized identifying student, I chose another source from somebody that's from Southeast Asia because it's kind of a luxury to be able to eat durian in Vietnam. So I chose those sources based on that assumption of wanting to look at this culture and how it affects me for a student who is Vietnamese American compared to a mainstream identifying source where they, uh, so Vice's approach isn't really informational. They went into it with not that much background, which I thought was kind of good because it was sort of like you were learning with them. So this really strikes at the um, importance placed by the marginalized identifying student of having local voices and having a diverse perspective compared to vice, which emphasizes the American experience and the lack of knowledge as a sort of trade-off here. Um, when we look at essays, we see a similar difference, but here we see it along racial lines between students of color and white students. So students who identified as persons of color in their college applications had a total source analysis score of 3.79, again out of 7, compared to white identifying students who had a score of 2. Um, and this is just above the 0.5 statistical um, threat, like significance threshold, but since it's a marginal case, we report this finding because it aligns with a lot of the other findings that we have. So again, here for a similar comparison from a student of color, the Vox article is primarily built around the general social survey, which by itself is not enough to prove the author's point, especially given the flaws with the GSS that have already been identified. So a critique of one of their sources in terms of the evidence and source type that are used compared to a white identifying student. A similar counter argument can be made how soy lint is likely an improvement over people's current diets. I can see that a lot of the teamwork in micronutrients could be lacking, but this can be fixed over time as soy lint develops. As seen on their website, they have updated their vanilla flavor to more closely follow FDA nutritional guidelines. So here we see a student uh, who identifies as white who is using information from the PR department from the soy lint company in order to defend it against charges that the product doesn't work very well, which is a problematic use of sources. So looking at some of the trust indicators individually, valuing local voices was one place where um, where students of color, marginalized identifying students, and students who identified as defending their own culture were very different from the comparison group. So here we see in interviews, um, is the difference is very stark. So students who identified as people of color averaged a score of 0.63 for valuing local voices compared to an average score of zero for white students. And as a little piece of information about this, 
Um, in the case of white students, this was a case of canceling out between students who said they did value local voices and students who explicitly said they did not value or rejected the importance of local voices as biased. Um, and so to kind of see how this plays out from students of color, I wanted a primary source about Durian, like somebody that's directly from that country that I'm talking about. Similarly, I felt a lot of struggle. I felt struggle because a lot of articles regarding Balut on the internet just explain what it is. They don't explain anything about it or its cultural significance. And then lastly, I began by looking at where the practice of dog meeting, dog of eating dog meat started and the culture of South Korea. And so I found a couple of sources that were good for that. And then I also wanted to look at firsthand accounts because, you know, I wanted to describe the food itself. And all of these focus on the what local voices contribute that's distinctive and valuable. So similarly, um, defending students who defended their own culture also interviews were a place to showcase um, the prioritization of local voices. So here we see a similar trade-off, 0.67 of, of average score for defending own culture students compared to 0.1 for non-defenders. Um, and this one also was a little bit above the 0.5 threshold, so marginal significance, but again, it aligns with some of the findings that we just reported. So a, kind of an example of how this works. I remember seeing a video from BuzzFeed about durian pop up in my YouTube feed, and I remember watching it and thinking, oh my God, this is so rude. People were basically mimicking that they're throwing up and stuff like that. I touched about this in my essay, but in my family, durian is considered something really luxurious and really important. And so I was slightly offended by that. And so I was looking for sources that kind of offended me because I was like, this shows the cultural difference between American and Vietnamese cultures. And I also wanted to find sources that support both sides. So you can see here how the student's own experience lends them to see local voices as important because they see those local voices that they have experienced in their own lives being dismissed or ridiculed in other popular sources. So again, we see also some discussion in the essays of the valuing of local voices. So here again, defending versus non-defending, but the difference is not quite as stark. Um, a 0.83 score for defending on culture students compared to 0.3 for non-defenders. So as an example of how this works in comparison. This student is um, who identifies as a defender is comparing an article written by a professor to an article written by a student and finding value in both, but the value is different. So from the article written by the professor, her evidence come, does come from personal experience, but of a much broader variety. She built and administered the gender studies department at her university and thus observed its impacts on many students for an extended period. Compared to the experiential account of a student, she comes at this from a student's perspective, which provides diversity in a conversation otherwise dominated by academics and journalists. Again, however, her experience is, evident is experiential, which limits the generalizability of her findings. Still, these testimonies emphasize impact on the student's character. Um, another dimension that we looked at was scrutiny of sources' own sources, so critically evaluating source evidence. So here in essays, we saw students of color being more rigorous in the evaluation of source evidence than white students, with uh, students of color averaging a score of 0.71 compared to white students um, averaging 0.25. Um, similarly, we saw a similar trade-off in um, marginalized identifying students and mainstream identifying students, where marginalized identifying students average 0.75 and mainstream identified students average 0.22. So this is from a student who is both marginalized and uh, both identifies as marginalized and identifies as a student of color um, writing about source scrutiny. Um, a Fox News article, Eating Balut Going Too Far by Chris Killam, includes a video where Dr. Manny Alvarez, a reporter, and Killam, an author, educator, and a medicine hunter, goes out to Maharlika Filipino Merderno in New York City to try out Balut. Dr. Manny was terrifyingly explaining several statements while he was in the restaurant. I don't eat babies. I don't want to. I can't do this. No, 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 no. I can't even look at it. Although the Vietnamese are accustomed to eating balut, Americans who are focused on the proper treatment of animals reject the practice. So calling into question the use of such a sort of xenophobic source as a primary source of information on this topic. So um, in essays, we also found differences between student groups in terms of critically evaluating the expertise of the author of the article. So marginalized identifying students here um, were superior to mainstream identifying students in terms of their ability to look at source expertise. So with marginalized identifying students averaging a 0.88 score compared to mainstream identifying students averaging only 0.44. And here we see exemplified a marginalized identifying student uh, interrogating author expertise. So she writes, professors being intimately involved with both students' academic development in addition to their well-being are in a unique position to weigh in on this issue. 
Morton Keller, professor emeritus at Brandeis University writing in the Atlantic, holds a cynical view on the state of campus free speech. And then shifting gears to students, adding a student perspective to the debate, Bella Rios of the Santa Clara, the student newspaper at Santa Clara University, chronicled the controversy surrounding student attempts to found a Turning Point USA chapter at Santa Clara University.